Welcome to this special edition of the CMU Now on the KAFM Community Affairs Hour. I'm Caitlin Birdsall, along with my co-host David Ludlam. As the nation is embroiled in one of the most significant civil rights discussions in decades, one man at Colorado Mesa University has found himself in the spotlight. CMU head football coach Tremaine Jackson will be our guest today. Coach Jackson will speak with us about his background, his activism, and who he is as a person, a coach, and a community leader. Coach Jackson, we want to welcome you to the show. Thank you for coming on today. Yeah, thanks for being here. Yeah, glad to be here. Glad to be here. It's really nice that, you know, we can actually be together, even though we're still practicing our social distancing. We've got our face masks and all of that good stuff, but it's nice to actually be back together with some people for the show. It's been a while. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Well, why don't we just go on ahead and dive right in? Mm -hmm. So, um, Coach Jackson, I'm going to assume that there is no way that you accept or you expected after accepting this position to Colorado Mesa University as the head football coach that you would be dealing with not only a global pandemic, um, but that you would emerge as a campus leader um, speaking out on a national stage. I was wondering, can you explain to us what this unexpected turn in your life has been like for you? Yeah, yeah, well, you know, I teased President Foster and said, hey, if um, if you had told me I was going to have to deal with all this stuff before we could get to the field and even practice, um, I probably would have second-guessed this whole <laughs> deal. And so, mm-hmm. um, no, I, I think it's been a blessing, um, honestly. Uh, we've been able, as a coach, you always want your team uh, to be together, to be family. People say – uh, we're a family, we're, we're all together. Well, now in these times, um, you, you have to be that in order to uh, continue to move forward. You know, from a football side, um, as coaches, we say the game is 90% mental, 10% physical. Well, that's really being tested too mm-hmm. uh, because all we've had is Zoom meetings and things of that nature. We haven't had any physical. And so everything that – all our processes that we've had in coaching have been tested. But most of all, all of the processes that we have – in growing men, um, in building future leaders. Those are being tested right now, too. Mm-hmm. And so for me, it's been good to see this football team come together in more than just football, um, but but to be able to have real conversations, understand each other, and really grow together and, and move forward. So it's been fun. Great. And I feel like our team is lucky to lucky to have you on board and have you as the, the leader of the team. <laughs> I'm lucky to have them. <laughs> they, they didn't pick me. I picked them. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm lucky to have them, but I am glad to be here. So, Coach Jackson, your name has been all over the place. You've been on news broadcasts and newspapers. You've been all over social media. So I think people are getting to know your name and your face and now your voice. But we want to get to know you a little bit. So can you tell us about, you know, where you come from, how you got here? I mean, where did you grow up? Yeah, I grew up in Houston, Texas, on the north side of Houston, neighborhood called Acres Homes Community. And, and, um, you know, grew up rough. My mom was there. But my grandmother really took my life over. Um, Mom got married. I stayed with my grandma. Um, Grew up in a house full of women. Uh, My grandfather died when I was nine. And from then on, it was nothing but women, my sister, my aunt. And uh, so I kind of grew up rough but but loved. And, um, And I knew the difference between right and wrong. And even when I wanted to go fiddle in some things that I shouldn't have, uh, I knew I had a foundation. Grew up in the church. Uh, that was that was who we were. And, you know, I, I got into coaching um, after I played. I was fortunate enough to get a football scholarship, played at two different schools, Louisiana Monroe and Texas Southern. And after I got done, I knew I wanted to stay close to coaching or stay close to the game, and so I got into coaching. And uh, it's been a 14-year whirlwind. I've been all over the country. I've been to South Dakota and Missouri, and most of my career was in Texas, but now I'm here on the western side of Colorado, which I'd never known about. Uh, so it, it's been good. And you, you said you grew up rough but loved. I mean, that's an appropriate uh, phrase from someone that coaches football, right? Mm-hmm. you got to yeah. have both in the programs. So. Yeah, you yeah. know, my grandmother is the toughest football coach I had. Um, she motivated me the most. Uh, I couldn't just sit in the house and play Nintendo, which was the hot thing at that time. I had to get outside and – if she was going to pay $80 for me to participate in Little League football, then she was going to make sure I was doing something uh, to prepare. So I learned about hard work, not from a man, but from a woman. Uh, I watched her do a lot of different things throughout our, throughout my life. And uh, I always tell people she was my first head coach, and uh, and she made sure she got her money's worth from it too. <laughs> 
Well, great. Well, you are listening to CMU Now on KAFM Community Affairs, and our guest today is Colorado Mesa University's Tremaine Jackson. So we were just obviously chatting about your grandma, and for me personally, I love getting to hear stories of people's families and where they come from and the impact, obviously, that she had on your life. And and I wonder if you could equate to, you know, kind of where you are today and that impact that she's had on you. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so, you know, the the example that she set for me a long time ago is what I use now with my family and how I coach my kids and and how I really approach life. And so um, I'm I'm a strong faith guy. Um, I'm not a preacher by any means, but I'm very well versed in the word. And and, um, that's just who I am. And we can't, I can't hide that. And we try to live that uh, as as we go out, um, one thing about me though is I'm willing to go meet people where they are, mm-hmm. um, in order to help bring them to a certain point or whatever point they want to get to. And I think that's that's what's really rolled over in my coaching career. I've been able to go into places I'm not familiar with, and then places I'm very familiar with, um, and and be able to lead kids in different ways, and be able to, to sit back and learn different things as well. And so. If it had not been for her, mm-hmm. I don't know if I would have been that well versed. And and she was different. She got me to a certain point, and then she started getting coaches in my life because I my father was absent. So she knew she could only take me so far. Um, you know, she's tenth grade education. She's probably the smartest person I know. And um, so she got me to those points, and then coaches took over, and I was able to uh, become who I am between both of those avenues. Coach, I, I, I might get the words wrong. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I remember hearing you say when you first started something like, you don't use young men to make a better football team, but but you use football to, be, to make better young men. Yep. And and that's a philosophy in our culture you don't hear very often. I think the emphasis is usually put on the sport yep. and not, not the person. And, and so you're using football, I think, to make the world better. How did you arrive at that philosophy? Is that part of this, your background with your grandmother? What else went into that? Yeah, it's just, you know, experiences throughout my life, experiences from, from watching other players, people that I play with, um, not not even from a football field, but uh, just seeing how football brought people together and football was love. You know, we're in America, so if you say uh, baseball is not America's game, you could get hit with a baseball from somewhere, but truly – I really believe football is America's game because it's the closest thing you come to from a sport where you're living a day-to-day, closer to your day-to-day life. Um, and so football is life and life is football. And so we, because there's such a direct correlation, I think you can build young men through the game of football. It's a melting pot. I mean, we got people from everywhere, from all cultures, all diversities, every all parts of the country, and they all come together every August to work toward a common goal. It can be unifying. That's yeah. it. And so isn't that what our world is supposed to be about? Aren't we supposed to be working together for the common goal of having a great life and living the American dream and, and just the dream in general? And so I, I, I think um, I learned a long time ago in my coaching career that uh, if you start working on building men and teaching them how to work together to reach a common goal, you'll win football games, you'll win championships, and they will always remember how they got there and not just the score of some game. Yeah, and I feel like that fits really well too, just with our philosophy here at CMU. You know, President Foster is always talking about that we we do have our student athletes. They're mm-hmm. students first, people yeah. first, and athletes second, that we're, we're building educated citizens, and that's the most important part. And then we're happy to be able to supplement that with having these incredible athletes as well. So I feel like that philosophy fits really well with CMU. It's definitely the fun part now. Football is the, the game itself is the cherry on top. Mm-hmm. But there's so much stuff that goes into getting ready for the game uh, that when you're on the team, you understand. When you're in the stands – you see the final product, mm-hmm. but their Monday through Friday was so rigorous and in preparing um, until you know it, it's fun to go through that process with these guys. Yeah. Well, you are listening to CMU now on KAFM Community Affairs, and our guest today is Colorado Mesa University's Tremaine Jackson. Um, so, Coach, I don't know if, if many of our listeners have heard or not, but you were in some headlines this week. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think that you intervened in a situation that could have ended a lot differently than it was. And I know for myself watching the Facebook Live as mm-hmm. I was at, at home and in my office that, you know, it was really interesting to see how you handled that situation. Um, you walked into a police station with peaceful protesters and were able, I think, 
to leave it in a really great way where you left with handshakes and left with room for more action after that. So I was wondering if you could kind of take our listeners into that lobby and then what was it like for you? What was it like for your players? And if you could kind of talk us through that a little bit. Yeah. So um, to understand that moment, I think you have to understand how we, the leading up to that and leading up to that wasn't that day. It was um, from our team meeting that we had on Sunday and we had an open forum with our team where we had our white kids talk to black kids, talk to brown kids, and everybody kind of, if you had a question, you asked a question, and then somebody would answer it. And we as coaches stayed out of answering the questions. Uh, but we had 135 guys on Zoom, and I've been in a lot of team meetings. It might have been the most powerful team meeting I've ever been in. It was so powerful until coaches did get on there and say, hey, guys, listen, I'm ignorant to this or I never understood this. I'm from this place where I've never seen uh, the different diversities, and this is what we have to do. I'm sitting there as the black coach that's, that really has been living this, these issues, and I didn't have to say anything. And so from that team meeting, uh, one of our summer captains actually said, Coach, can we show that we're unified at some other – uh, participants from different sports, we want to get together and we want to basically protest. And I said, as long as it's peaceful, absolutely, we can we can do that. I'll support you. Um, I think you have to let young people say what they need to say um, because they're going to say it regardless. And I think it's better if they allow you to be in the room when they say it. There is an issue. They were angry. Uh, angry is a manifestation of lost hope. And so I want our kids to always have hope. And so I, I went with them. I stood in the back. We walked. I, I didn't know we were going to walk five miles to the police station. I would have worn some better shoes. Uh, but when we walked in that police station, uh, things turned, and it got really aggressive. And um, if you watch the video, I allowed it to be aggressive for about as long as I was going to allow it to be aggressive because I think we have to understand the hurt uh, we have to understand the pain. We have to understand the frustration. And at that moment, I felt like the only way to for a chief shoemaker to really understand that was to stand in the line of fire uh, that was happening, uh, per se. And so um, at, there came a point to where I felt like we weren't getting anywhere anymore. Mm -hmm. And so guys got angry um, and, and a group left. Uh, but my players knew to stay because they asked me to be here. Um, we talked about how we handle situations like this, and we know that we, we can get more uh, flies with honey, uh, per se. Um, not to not be angry, but to get your point across, understand what the other person is saying, so then we can proceed to action. And I thought once once we got to that point, um, that started happening. I really don't – I need to watch the video because I really don't <laughs> remember what I said, but uh, I just know I wanted everybody to understand that we have a chief of police, that a chief shoemaker that is willing to listen. And the places that I've been, um, that I've lived, that hasn't happened. And so if you got somebody willing, then you gotta, you gotta use that. But nobody's willing to stand there and be yelled and screamed at and cursed at, nobody. Mm -hmm. Coach, I wanna make sure I understand this. So there, was, there were some folks who became angry mm -hmm. and they left, mm -hmm. but all your players just knew that they needed to stay yep. despite that anger. And that, that was the difference between the culture you've been building and the conversation you had during your team meeting yep. and, and not. Yeah, they, sort of the they knew to stay because we wanted answers. We came for answers. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you want answers, you don't leave when you, when you don't have an answer. Uh, but we know a way to get to get answers. And we wanted to see action. That's, that's what everybody wants. Um, sadly, guys, we've been talking for, for 50, 60 years. Uh, it's time for action, and, and we stayed there to get action. And some other people outside of our team stayed as well because I think they saw uh, which way we were going with it and that we eventually could get to a, a, a solution. The the powerful image of one of your players shaking hands with the police chief, I, I made um, you know, publications statewide throughout Colorado. Mm -hmm. uh, were you there during that handshake? I and was. What, what, can you explain what that feeling was and kind of how that, that handshake came to be? Yeah, bad picture of me. I was in the back too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, no, you know, Aaron Aaron went up and shook his hand. Um, and, I, and Aaron is a, is a really sharp young man. Um, he's black. Um, Aaron Howard, he's from Phoenix. He comes from a really educated family. 
Uh, but Aaron Howard was one of the guys that wanted to be there. And so Aaron Howard is a leader on our team, but he's a leader in this campus community as well. And so when he shook his hand, I asked him right after, why did you do that? And he said, Coach, I, it's time for a solution. And I wanted to show everyone that we needed to have solution. We have somebody, like you said, that's willing to listen. Um, we can come to a solution and we can have action. And so I was very proud of him because that wasn't staged. He did that stuff on his own. And um, I was proud proud to be his coach. That's yeah. what I'm saying. That had to be a really proud moment for you as a coach to, to see your players stepping up into that leadership no doubt. role and taking in everything that you've been talking about yeah. and putting it into action. Sometimes you wonder if they're listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like they were. Yeah. Well, great. Well, you are listening to CMU Now on KAFM Community Affairs, and our guest today is Colorado Macy University's Tremaine Jackson. Well, maybe this is kind of re- repeating some of the conversation we just had, but you know, you look out across the horizon in our country and there's so much division on, you know, ethnic lines and, and racial lines. And you described already for us, I think, today how you're working in the program to bridge those divides and bridge those gaps and smooth those things out. Do you see some of the methodologies that you've been using with players being something that could be expanded to to the community? I, I think you're probably going to be asked by people in this community to continue speaking and talking mm-hmm. and organizing do you see any potential for taking your philosophies and building those out? Yeah, I, I do. Um, you know, I, I was telling some people earlier this week when they said, Coach, you know, you're, you're kind of an activist now. You didn't want to, you, you didn't sign up for this. <laughs> I, I, I actually did. Um, I didn't know it was going to manifest like this, um, but I prayed for an opportunity to be a leader and to help lead young men and to make a difference in a community. Um, I, I didn't, I think the people that interviewed me, they said that that was probably just interview talk, but I really meant that. And you have to be with me every night on my knees to know that that's what's going on. But um, now that we're here, I'm in too deep to get out. Um, I, at some point, I'm going to have to be about the business of the football team. But right now, uh, while we've got a listening ear, I think we, we need to push forward. And so I think what we need is acknowledgement, you know, and, and we're getting that on, on our side of in our community. Um, I think those are some ide- ideologies that – you know, we can push across this state. And I've, I've been getting calls from coaches that have seen pictures asking how, how did you do that? How did you get um, involved in the in, with the chief of police? And I told President Foster that, that if we did this right, if we did it and took as much energy and support as we did COVID-19 um, and used that same blueprint, then we could be the example. And with his support and, and the rest of the community support, it's not just a football thing anymore. It's one team, and whoever wants to be on the team can come and get on the team. And so um, now everybody can't play in the game, but everybody can come be on the team. And so um, I'm, I'm fully ready for this. Uh, my family's ready for it, and we're, we're all strapped in, locked in, ready to go. And I think that speaks to, you know, not only – to the work that you're doing, but the relationships that CMU has built Mm -hmm. over the years with our community. I think Mm -hmm. that's also something for me that I love about our community is they embrace CMU and embrace not only our students, but our faculty and our staff. And I think our leadership team here have really worked hard to build those relationships with GJPD and other community organizations and departments so that when we do enter these really tough Mm -hmm. times where we're having to have really hard conversations that we already have that base foundation no of a relationship. No if the foundation had not already been there, mm-hmm. then we would have trying to, we would have start trying to build a foundation mm-hmm. and a house at the same time. Exactly. Now that there's a foundation, we can work on designing the house and making sure we move there. Yep. Well, good. Well, you are listening to CMU Now on KAFM Community Affairs, and our guest today is Colorado Mesa University's Tremaine Jackson. Um, so we were talking earlier about the peaceful protests that, you know, were somewhat provocative as well, <laughs> which, you know, nothing wrong with that. Um, but I'm just wondering, you know, why you think for us we've been able to so far keep these protests more peaceful. You know, I'm sure everyone has seen the news coverage across across our nation of some of the protests turning violent um, and things like that. So why do you think it is that here we've been able so far to maintain peaceful protests? Yeah, I, I don't, on this one, I don't think I know um, that we've been able to keep it peaceful because Chief Shoemaker has joined us. He's a, he's made some acknowledgement uh, of a lot of things. Uh, when we were on that protest the other day, he had some officers that scored us across the 
streets in this town and, and across stop signs and things of that nature. So he joined us. And when we walked in that police station, he didn't bring out the, the riot gear. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he's, he's openly acknowledged that there's a problem and he wants to help be a solution. And so I think when you're dealing with protests, um, the ultimate goal is to get seats at the table, not just one seat, but to get seats. And Chief Shoemaker has said he wants to sit at the table along with President Foster, along with other community leaders. And so um, I think that's why we've been able to keep it peaceful. Mm -hmm. Uh, There haven't been those issues that you're seeing on CNN every time you turn it on. Uh, We hope to keep it that way. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I also heard you talking about when when a student or any person really sees a problem that they believe or perceive to be bigger than them or unsolvable, that how, how you start solving that problem is to address it with where you sit. Mm-hmm. And I think you were talking about that in the context of you're going to work on this project in the community where you are, mm-hmm. on the team that you're coaching, mm-hmm. and the university where you're employed, yep. uh, and, and focus on that. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about how you arrived at that as your strategy as opposed to you know, I don't think you meant to be thrust in sort of the national yeah. voice, but you're, but you did, you, you have been because you're focused here. Like, yeah. how, how did you get there? Yeah. You know, I, I honestly, um, when this whole COVID-19 thing happened, I watched how people across the country knew nothing about it, um, but they knew it was killing people and they came together and we came up with all these protocols and we changed life as we know it. Um, through coming together and forming these uh, committees and all of this stuff. And so I said, when this when this happened, um, we at Colorado Mesa did a fabulous job. We're getting, I, I hear our president is getting calls from other major college presidents on how we're doing it. So I said, well, if we were, if we are the light in COVID-19 on how to return to campus, then certainly we can put together protocols here in this community, on our campus, through our leadership um, to be the light across the state and the country in this. Um, This is a pandemic that's been going on. Mm -hmm. Uh, Unfortunately, nobody really, it's kind of the one everybody kind of puts to the side, but this is a pandemic. It's been going on. We knew something about it and we know it's killing people. And so keeping the same energy as some of my players would say, we, we have to address it and I think we're doing that here. I know we're doing that here. Um, and, and we're going to be the light because of the calls that we've gotten, because of the calls the chief has gotten, because of the calls President Foster has gotten. I know we're going to be the light and, and kind of the first plan on how to attack this. Great. Well, you are listening to CMU Now on KFM Community Affairs, and our guest today is Colorado Mesa University's Tremaine Jackson. Um, so obviously, we, all throughout our conversation, we've been talking about your life experiences yeah. and what has brought you here today and the direction you chose to take your life in helping young students. Um, and so I think with that, you're helping them find their voice and guiding them in a great direction, which I think is amazing. <laughs> but right now on social media, of course, there's a lot of chatter from everyone across yeah. the nation that wants to weigh in and has an opinion. I'm just curious for you to kind of break through that noise, like what would you want our listeners and for us to hear and know that maybe we don't know currently about racism and bias in our community and our nation and maybe what you've you've faced personally? Yeah, I, I think people um, need to understand that this young generation, they're, they're really upset and they're really hot-headed. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not about sitting around talking. They want action. And you have to explain to them. You know, I grew up in a time where um, my grandmother would tell me to go over here, and it was because she said so, and she didn't have to explain to me. I think, to really, because of how they're being raised these days, in a back-and-forth relationship, when, when they get here or to any college campus, they've been explained to. So the minute that there's an issue, they get angry. They don't hear the reason, and they only hear the explanation. And so I think you have to understand what we're dealing with first. Now you have to understand that there's a race problem in this country. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a black and white issue, literally, um, in this country, and we we can't sweep that under the rug anymore. You know, people talk about Black Lives Matter, and people try to say all lives matter. Well, we understand that. But right now, the issue is Black Lives Matter. And I think you have to acknowledge that. And again, I keep using that word acknowledgement. 
this generation wants acknowledgement because I want acknowledgement. And I'm not in their generation. I want acknowledgement. But I want to move forward after we acknowledge. But we cannot move forward until we acknowledge that there's an issue and you're willing to listen to my side and we move forward. Um, and because I'm willing to listen to your side. I've been, and it, it's sad to say that we're in a my side, your side world, mm-hmm. but we actually are right now. And, and we're not afraid to just be brutally honest. There's no room for politics in this. It is what it is and it ain't what it ain't. And it is a black and white issue and we have to be willing to acknowledge it. We have to be willing to ex- receive the acknowledgement and then work toward a solution. Uh, to sit down for, for 45 minutes and come up with all like a plan, <laughs> I've got a plan, all right, we're going to put that in together next year. Uh, no, we're past that. We have to put together the action. And then we have to stay consistent with the action. And so uh, I think that's what we're doing here on this campus, and, and we're going to be able to roll that out to this community. Well, Coach, I, maybe we can wrap up our conversation today with where we began. And, and I was looking through some of the the, uh, the handouts and the, that you've given players, and mm-hmm. one of the pillars, uh, is it your, in your community pillars? Is that what uh, it's called? The, the, yeah, just our culture pillars. Your culture pillars, yeah. yeah. One of them, I think, was just love. Mm-hmm. That was That was it. Mm-hmm. And, you, I mean, people think about football as being a violent sport. And you explained earlier a little bit about love. But I thought that was interesting that that's an actual pillar. Mm-hmm. And you, I think it said that um, you teach coaches to love players and players to love each other. Mm-hmm. Is that – could you – where is. did you get that? Is that did, – did you did you come up with that or so, did you – No. No, I'm not that smart. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it was interesting. Uh, I mean, I, you wouldn't think of that, but it, it, was, yeah. it was interesting to see. So, you know, we, we hold up four fingers in the fourth quarter and all of that stuff. And, and people think it's for the fourth quarter, and it's really not. It's – it's talking about the four pillars of the program. The third finger, which is the ring finger, uh, is is our love pillar. And it's it's our job as coaches, I really believe this, to truly love players, even when they're not doing what you ask them to do, uh, because we're in a profession where we're going to get burned. And I think that's what's wrong with America, too. Nobody wants to get burned. If I love you, when I get burned, I might be mad. But I love you, so I'm going to continue to work toward a solution with you. Uh, we tell players it's not a I, you don't I don't need your love. I got a family, um, I got I got friends. Uh, I joined a fraternity. I got a hundred thousand people I know. It's your job to truly love the man next to you and to love each other. If those guys, if coaches will love players and players will truly love each other, then it does not matter how talented we are. And we really believe that carryovers even in life. It doesn't matter if you're the smartest. It doesn't matter if you're if you're the most technical. What matters is that you, I love you, you love you, you love him. We're all in this together, and we truly understand that because at the end of the day, we know that love cures all things. Um, and so that that's a really big part for us. It's third, but it's first uh, because we end up loving guys in our program that you don't even know. And it's it's it when people don't understand love on a certain level, then their mind start goes and going in different places, and they say, "Coach, you, the guy just signed with you. How do you love him?" Well, I love him because he signed with me, and because I told his parents we were gonna love him, and so a lot of things become lip service. Love in our program is really really big. It's how we've been able to be successful at places I've been um, that shouldn't have been. Well, Caitlin, I can't think of a better way to wrap up the mm-hmm. show than on love being the solution to all of these problems. So thank you, Coach. And yeah. It's yeah. nice. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really so appreciate it. Thank you. Well, this segment airs on the second Tuesday of each month on KAFM Community Radio. You can also listen to a podcast of today's show at kafmradio.org. I'm your host, Caitlin Birdsall, along with my co-host, David Ludlam. And we'll be back next month for another edition of CMU Now on the Community Affairs Hour.